from the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering UiPath Forward Four, brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to Las Vegas. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante at UiPath Forward Four. We have had it all today. Lots of great guests. We've had weather. We've had rain. We are outside and uh, lots of great conversations going on. Next up, we're going to be talking about automation at healthcare giant Merck. Joining us from Merck is Dan Boyd, automation leader, and from CGI, partner of UiPaths, Bill Engel, senior automation architect. Guys, welcome to the program. Thank you for Thank having you us. so much. Thanks for having us. So Dan, well, let's go ahead and start with you. Let's talk about Merck and the, the, implement, and, and the adoption of automation at such a history company. Yeah, Thank you. Um, our journey started about two years ago and started with a small team and has evolved ever since. We started just a handful of folks. We've evolved uh, from the size of our team, matured operationally and expanded our capabilities along that journey to where we are today and it continues to evolve as the technology changes. And it's been exciting to see the adoption at Merck over, you know, across the enterprise, um, it's been an educational process, but it's been exciting just to see that understanding of the power that automation can deliver to them and they see the value. And making it real to them has been key. Um, then that once it's real, then they get excited and the word spreads and they appreciate the value right before their eyes. And, and, and Bill, are you uh, uh, industry specialized or more automation specialized? Yeah, so, I, yeah so I'm more uh, automation specialized. Okay. But uh, you know, CGI, we partner with our industry experts to identify use cases for automation and I help kind of you know, solution the, the best approach to automation. Uh, and you know, so I actually started you know, with, with Merck a little bit earlier before it was really formalized and uh, just CGI is a, a large partner of Merck and embedded within various areas of business. And you know, I I end up educating uh, CGI on automation. And here's what to look for, you know, in a in a in a great use case for automation. And you know, really we started to drum up some internal excitement, and then came up with some actual real use cases within Merck. Proved it out early, and then we began to partner with uh, Dan and his team. Can you share a little bit about some of those use cases? Yeah, so you know the ones that uh, we've worked on are really specific within uh, various areas uh, within the division. So, Dan, you want to talk about some of sure. the ones that you're working on? Yeah, I'll share one uh, use case within a specific market at, at Merck, and it's a commercial area where they were embarking on a, 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 a revision in their customer enga engagement approach in this market, and where the, the, they had a problem. They, they needed to get the invoices out of SAP for customers. So that was on the one side of the process. On the other was a customer portal where the customers needed access in near real time to those invoices. So when they came to us, they had the invoices kind of set up to, to be emailed out of SAP. So they had that process set up. The problem was how do they get them over here into this customer portal? So they, the, the, the backup plan was to have uh, temporary workers come on and, and do that manually, handle the open the emails with the invoice attachments and, and get them loaded. So we came in, uh, they called us in in the 11th hour and we were able to, fortunately the, the process was straightforward, uh, where it was invoices were coming through uh, an email attachment and that was set up so basically we automated the reading of the emails, the processing of the PDF attachments and save them into a shared drive where there was another process to load them into SAP. So the volume was really large on a daily basis. Initially it was estimated at approximately 2,500 emails per day with these invoices. Um, so that would, the estimated would take about 125 hours of people time to do that manually. Um, so that's what we automated. And in the end it was, the average is, it's over 3,000 a day. So. Um, the solution really came in and, and we were able to deliver that and it's been really, they were, they were ecstatic with what they could do and then they saw the, the art of the possible with, with this automation. So it's a good success story and um, it's exciting to see and they were thrilled. And it's not an uncommon story, right, where you're automating mundane tasks, that was pushing a lot of paper, a lot of copy and pasting. Right. Um, do you 
So how far away, and maybe we're there already, you think about Merck, it's a, it's a, in a, in a unique industry, you got, you got highly skilled scientists doing serious R&D, high risk trials, you got partners, you do some organic, some inorganic, you, you've got the manufacturing components, so a lot of different parts to the business. And when you think about saving time, as you think about some of the, the scientists that, that, that are, are, are working on various pipeline products, highly paid, if you can save more of their time, wow, right. that even drops more to the bottom line. Are we at that point yet? We heard the stats this morning was 2% or some single digit percentage of our processes are automated. How far away are we from attacking those types of automations? Or are we there today? Uh, we do automations for all the, all the functions across Merck. Um, in some places, adoption is farther along than others mm -hmm. in their journey, but yeah, um, from the, the shop floor and the manufacturing sites, we found opportunities to, to, to introduce automation there and even in, in the labs in various capacities. So yeah, the, the use cases continue to grow and the adoption, continue, we see that growing as, as well. Do you find that the, the highly skilled uh, automations to, uh, targeted at highly skilled folks are, are harder to sort of get your hands around, but they give you bigger ROI, or is it not the case? Is it all sort of churn and burn on the I, ROI? Yeah, from my perspective, I think it's you know, use case by use case. Uh -huh. Like, if, it, if it's a, a complex use case that requires you know, more advanced you know, you know, capabilities, uh, you know, machine learning models, you know, leveraging uh, you know, AI center within UiPath, uh, you know, those, th they can you know, you know, provide you know, fairly sizable ROI. But I think is for those highly skilled workers, I'll, I'll give one example, is you know, out, in, out in the labs, we, we helped you know, automate some things that you know, just made their life easier, right? Uh, you know, tests running overnight, if something failed uh, with a with test that was happening, then you know, they, they wouldn't know about it and they'd lose critical data for, for these early tests that they're doing in, in the, in the preclinical cycle. So we actually put in uh, UiPath robots to, to monitor and, and send alerts and, and provide recovery to make their lives uh, you know, a, lot, a lot easier. Uh, so they don't have to worry about things you know, failing in the middle of the night. You have a UiPath robot you know, supporting them in that, that aspect. What's an automation architecture look like? I mean, where do we start architecting automation? Well, I think the journey, uh, so where do you start with an automation, right? It's really understanding the use case. It comes down to what is the end-to-end the -end process, and then where, where can we automate uh, within that process, and what is the right uh, set of automation uh, capabilities? So, you know, RPA is great for, you know, um, where, we, it, we, where we need to interact with user interfaces, but if we can, uh, you know, interact with APIs, we'll, we would do that, you know, pr preferably over uh, UIs, just to keep, keep it more of a seamless integration. But I think it's about understanding the process, laying out the right solution. Uh, if there's an opportunity to improve the process prior to automating it, you know, if, there's, if there is that ability, then we'll look to do that, and, we, and we've done that. We may change, that process uh, up a little bit just to make automation more efficient, more effective. Uh, and, and so, and then just, we build it and we deploy it and they start to realize the value. How hard is it, Dan, to improve the, on the process versus just automating what's, what's known? In other words, right. you've got dependencies and there are complexities there. Yeah. What, what's your experience in, in terms of yeah, how you approached it? From my experience, and I, what we found to be a best practice, and, and Bill touched on it, but every use case is, of course, different, and the, the corresponding process, very, very varied. But really what's key, I think, is to right up front understand the end-to-end -end process. And in a lot of cases, my team, it's new to us, right? But the, the process owners, they, they live it every day. So understanding, partnering with them to really understand the end-to-end -end solution in the form of like a, a process map. So you can kind of echo back your understanding of their process and get that nod of the head from them, say yes, you understand that this is an accurate representation, and then we can, with the spirit of trying to get it right the first time, and, but it really, I think, is incumbent upon us to really get that in-depth understanding up front, 
And in a lot of cases, if there's time sensitivity, and then it's just more efficient and saves a lot of rework. So, yeah. so working backwards, sorry, Lisa, uh, working backwards from the known existing process and then implementing an automation is probably the best starting point, as opposed to trying to work backwards from some kind of uh, outcome that you envision. But, but I would think there's attractiveness in the, in the latter, right. so that you're not just right. repeating a process right. that may be outdated. Yeah, so you're, uh, it comes down to a couple things. So when you're initially looking at a process, you know, should we automate this or not? and how complex is it, you need to understand what is the potential benefit. So, you know, how much, uh, you know, how much time am I able to, uh, you know, have those workers reinvest into other areas of work, right? Or what, other, what are some other benefits? Uh, you know, there, there may be some, uh, you know, compliance fines that we're experienced or through automation we're able to, you know, to make sure we're meeting SLAs and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot to you know defining the benefits of the automation, putting a value to that, and then the process of going through the actual process to understand the complexity, right? And then you can come up with, you know, here's here's what it's going to take to build this thing. Here's the potential value, and then we have ways where we track, you know, what's how's that ROI trending once it's in production. Uh, so hopefully that gives more insight. Dan, I got a question for you. One of the conversations that Dave and I had earlier on the program was about automation as a boardroom topic. I'd love to get your perspectives. Merck is a history to organization, been around for a long time. Cultural change is incredibly challenging. But I'd love to get your perspective on where is automation at Merck's board? Is that something that is really key to transformation? I'd say automation falls under our strategic initiative just around uh, Digital, digital transformation, right? So it's a sub-pillar of, of that. So that is a strategic imperative and very important and just being a more efficient and, and leveraging technology effectively um, just to make Merck more efficient and, and, and optimized and, and RPA and automation plays a, a part in that. I mean, that's what I suspected, Lisa, this morning when we were having that conversation. It seems to me that you wouldn't necessarily create an automation stovepipe at the board meeting. You might want to report on how these automations have affected, right. whether it's the income statement or the health of the company, mm -hmm. et cetera. But it seems to me to be a fundamental part of the digital transformation, um, which involves a lot of different things, data and cloud and strategy and right. Et, right. et cetera. So is that pretty common, Bill? Yeah, I, I, yes, it, it is. I mean, when, when an organization is looking to automate, there's you know, various angles are coming out. They're coming from the top-down approach where you know, management's saying, hey, we need to, we need to automate. Let's, let's look across all the divisions and, and figure out where, where we should go. But then it's also you know, bottom-up where you know, folks out, in, out within the various lines of business know, they, they know the problems, they know, they know the business processes. So there's a couple different angles where you know, you, you're able to discover you know, new opportunities to automate. Uh, but those also, those smaller ones open the door to understanding you know, much larger processes where we can look, you know, automate more of the upstream or, or, or downstream in that process, other variations of the process, so. Was, was Merck more bottom up or top down? Or <laughs> middle out? I, I would say it started <laughs> yeah. bottoms up, but yeah. shortly yeah. after it came from the top down, so as Bill touched on, I think it's really key that it, we do have, uh, from, from this coming from the top, from our leadership, right. is, is endorsing it and mm -hmm. advocating it, but also we're, on the, on the ground floor and, and educating, so the people with the hands on doing the process, they understand it, and the word is spreading. They see we've, we've made it real for them, now it's real for them, and, and they can appreciate the value, and, and they're happy to be able to do more, to be freed up from the tedious tasks and do more right. interesting work. Right. So would it start in a department, there was a champion with a budget who said, hey, I'm going to try this, and then yeah. look what I got. You, and you, then, de you yeah. definitely need the champion. So part of that is, is creating champions out in the different business lines to, to really own you know, the, the, the pipeline and, and understand the opportunities that are out there and say, yeah, this is a good opportunity, this, this one, let's look at it later. So you definitely have to have those folks out there uh, that, that understand the, the technology, but also understand the business. How has that changed in the last 18 months with healthcare care undergoing s such, I mean, my goodness, the things that have happened in the healthcare organization, how has that accelerated the need for things like automation? Right. Question for both yeah. of you and, and right. for Merck as well. Yeah. 
Go, you want to go first? Go sure. Yeah. So Merck initiated, a, like most companies, a digital transformation three, three plus years ago. And this just became an extension of that, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a must, right? Just to yeah. stay up with the, the digital transformation and everything that's happening in this world. And, and obviously, right. uh, COVID <laughs> accelerated, helped accelerate it in certain areas and made it real for a lot of people and appreciate the value and the need for it. Yeah, with, within CGI, just across all of our clients, it's automation is, is really towards the top of the list of, of strategic priorities. So, it's, so we've seen this massive just acceleration of, of needing to automate more and more and more, you know, which, is, which is great. What's it like inside of Merck these days? You guys must be really excited with all the, I mean, I know it's early days and yeah. nothing's been fully <laughs> yeah. blessed yet, but I mean, you know, some of the big pharma's got a lot of headlines and obviously, you know, we've been taking jabs, et cetera, but, but now here's Merck in the headlines. It's, it's got to be an exciting time for you guys. Yeah, it's, it's great to be a part of a company whose mission is to save and improve lives and Right, it's, um, with today, it's, it's really becoming real and more relevant uh, of that mission and vision, so it's exciting. Are there any gotchas when you go into this, I'm sure there are, into this automation journey? What, what kinds of things would you advise people? Hey, make sure that you deal with these, whether it's an out of scope consideration or things that you definitely yeah. don't want to do right. or do want to do. Yeah, it's, it just comes down to the, you know, choosing the right use case to start with, right? making sure that you, if you're just starting out in your automation journey, you know, start with those use cases that you can quickly prove value for and then tackle the, the more complex ones. That's great advice, great for folks to know where to start, especially when there's still such a tumultuous right. environment that we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. Dan and Bill, thank you for joining Dave and me today, talking about automation, the innovation that you're doing at Merck, partnering with CGI. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so thank much. You. Guys, thanks for having us. For Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin coming to you from windy, chilly-ish Las Vegas. We are at UiPath Forward 4. Stick around, Dave and I will be right back with our next guest.